Thank you, Peter, for a superb lecture. We will move on to the molecular chapter, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Griffith from Roswell Park Cancer Center, and she will talk about IPSSM. How does it improve patient management? Elizabeth. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for the opportunity to present this, uh, my thoughts on how the molecular IPSS improves our patient management. Uh, how do I make this go forward? Oh, here. Uh, these are my disclosures. So we've been asked to start with a question. Um, oh, my, the pretest question is, what defines the multi-hit state in TP53? Um, A, two or more distinct TP53 mutations. B, any TP53 variant allele frequency greater than or equal to 22%. C, TP53 mutations with concomitant loss of TP53 locus heterozygosity. D, TP53 variants of unknown significance. Or E, A, B, and C. Please select your answer. data. So for many years, we've, been appreci we've appreciated that um, mutations are a common feature of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. It's long been appreciated that simply by counting, the presence of additional mutations, more than one, two, three, four, six, is associated with higher risks for AML transformation. And elegant work has also shown us that specific gene mutational events, such as SF3B1, can be associated with better prognosis. And addition of mutational data to standard risk models, like the IPSSR, can upstage patients with lower risk and intermediate risk disease to higher risk disease associated with mutational events in the genes listed here. So recently, we've had some insight into this from a variety of large data sets, including the EuroMDS set. And here I highlighted a, a nice volcano plot published in the supplementary data of Dr. Bersinelli's recent paper, um, emphasizing statistical significance on the y-axis and log hazard ratio on the x-axis. Things on the left of the screen are associated with better prognosis, whilst things on the right of the screen, things like higher bone marrow blast percentage, higher age, and the presence of TP53 mutations are associated with worse prognosis. You can appreciate as we scroll down and look in, this, in the bottom of this graph, um, mutational events fall in a lower statistical significance area, uh, but have significant impact on survival. On the left, you can see the impact of SS3B1 mutations and platelet counts, similar in terms of statistical significance and, and impact. And on the right, commutational signatures, like the commutational events of ASXL1 and SRSF2, which are associated with poorer risk. You can also appreciate the presence of TP53, which is strongly associated with adverse risk at a high statistical significance. So this is quite complicated. And so until recently, we had no molecular prognostic standard that would allow us to um, include these specific and multi-mutational events into our ability to prognosticate. We certainly knew that more mutational events were worse, and that the presence of TP53 mutations was for sure bad. We also recognized that complex karyotype and loss of chromosome 7 or deletion chromosome 7Q were events that were associated with bad risk. But when we sit with patients sitting in front of us, how do we integrate all of this data? And how do we make sense of what, to, what treatments to choose, particularly treatment with um, allogeneic transplant, which is associated with substantial toxicity? So what did the IPSSM cohort tell us? Um, Three particularly high-risk groups were identified in this work. This cohort include, included almost 3,000 patients uh, which were, who were annotated for, who had bone marrow biopsies done at the time of original presentation and had next-generation sequencing performed. And all these patients were annotated for therapy and for uh, survival outcomes. Three high-risk groups were identified, those with mutations in TP53 in the so-called multi-hit state, those with mutations in FLT3. And a new group was identified, patients bearing KMT2A or MLL partial tandem duplications. And all three of these groups are associated with really the worst risk. Additionally, as previously published by 
some members of people who are in this room, <laughs> mutations in genes like ASXL1, DNMT3A, and others as listed here can be individually used to assess risk and are associated with individual worst risk. And additional risk can be added to this score by simply counting the presence of additional mutations. And you can you accrue an extra score of zero based on the presence of zero of these mutations, one or two or more additional mutations. And all of these can be incorporated um, using a convenient online tool, which I've listed here. So, oh, I missed my case at the beginning. That's what I was missing. Somehow my case was missing. Okay, so I presented a case at the beginning. My first slide was supposed to be a case called a woman by the name of JC. Mrs. C initially presented to my care. She was 76 years of age. She was previously well. She had no prior cancer history. And her primary doctor had noted that she had um, progressive pancytopenia over a period of six months. Her baseline white count was around three, her hemoglobin was around 11, and her platelet count was uh, 75. We performed a bone marrow biopsy, which demonstrated about 8% blasts, a normal karyotype, and uh, multilineage dysplasia. And we assessed her by IPSSR. And by IPSSR, she had uh, 3.5 points, which made her intermediate. Um, she came to see me. She was relatively well, although she was 76, and so we did refer her for in consideration of allogeneic transplant uh, after the first visit. We spent a little bit of time together, um, and she was very clear that she, she was wanting to focus on quality of life. Two weeks after I saw her, um, her next generation sequencing panel came back. But at the time that I originally seen her, as she was asymptomatic, we elected to proceed with watchful waiting, and we followed her counts every three months. When our next generation sequencing came back, it showed really shockingly a large number of mutational events, including individually prognostically relevant genes, in, uh, including a mutation in TP53 with a high variant allele frequency of 42%, mutation in ASXL1, RUNX1, SRSF2, and U2AF1. And then she also had mutations in, gene, in the genes IDH2 and STEG2. So by IPSSM, this patient who had been assessed as intermediate risk actually has very high risk with a projected leukemia-free survival of less than a year. So you can see here projected on the two curves uh, with poor median overall survival and a, high, a very high risk score. So this patient has high variant allele frequency TP53 mutant MDS. What is the TP53 multi-hit state in MDS? Dr. Um, Bernard's group published in 2021 the data from the, um, from the IPSSM cohort and identified patients with complex karyotype disease and those with multiple mutations involving TP53 as having a specifically poor risk subtype of disease. A majority of these patients, again, have complex karyotype, and they distinguished this group of people from the people they described as having monoallelic TP53 mutations. You can see here in the graph on the right Patients with uh, multi-hit state tend to do very poorly. Oh, sorry. Patients with multi-hit TP53 tend to do very poorly, whereas those with um, single mutations in TP53 in general have a prognosis that's much more like those with unmutated TP53. These data were also confirmed by a recent publication from the Dutch group in which patients with TP53 mutant MDS and AML had overlapping clinical outcome and uh, what's notable is this large cohort, um, a majority of patients had likely the multi-hit TP53 state as they mostly had complex karyotype. They all received, a majority of them received intensive chemotherapy and then allogeneic transplant. Soberingly, even those who achieved MRD negative remission had really dismal overall survival, speaking to this as a distinct entity with the need for novel therapeutics. So let's return to our case. This is our 76-year-old woman, relatively healthy. She went to see the transplant doctors, and she was deemed equivocally fit for transplant, but she was very clear that she was not interested in this approach. We followed her with watchful waiting every three months, and she demonstrated a progressive decline in counts, and she elected ultimately to enroll in a clinical trial of a novel oral hypomethylating agent. Serial marrow demonstrated high blast percentage between 13 and 15%, and unfortunately, she is developing a 17, uh, deletion 17. But she's currently status post cycle 10 of oral HMA therapy. She remains transfusion independent, and she has really pretty good quality of life. At the time the decision was made not to take this patient to transplant, we initiated an honest discussion about her prognosis and about the likely mechanisms of her death. 
And she made it really clear that she didn't want aggressive end-of-life measures and that she wished to die at home when that time came. So the U.S. guidelines for management of patients with high-risk MDS really cut people into those who are transplant eligible and ineligible and then suggest that we treat with hypomethylene agents without considering the nuances of who's likely to best benefit from this approach. And the fact is we only have a hammer, so everything is a nail. But the benefit of hypomethylene therapy is less clear for older patients and particularly patients with uh, more comorbidities. The HMA overall survival benefit for the oldest old is really only about three months. And it's pretty clear that people who get less than six cycles of therapy derive less benefit. Um, early discontinuation of therapy is associated with accrual of all the toxicity from treatment, but none of the survival benefit. And so it's important to figure out which patients we should treat. And for people who are relatively asymptomatic and non-transfusion dependent, especially if they're old, I often wait before I start therapy. So one of the most important things that I think we're beginning to appreciate in this field is that optimized symptom management is a very important approach, is important for um, optimizing quality of life. Recently, the WHO has redefined their definition of palliative care, and they say that palliative care approaches should be taken for any patient with life-threatening disease. There's recently also been an increased recognition that early goals of care discussions, uh, particularly discussions with the primary treating oncologist or hematologist that occur early on in the disease course, um, can result in less intensive end-of-life care, less in-hospital mortality, and increased utilization of hospice. I think one of the things that's going to help us in the future is optimized geriatric assessments and inclusion of health-related quality of life endpoints in clinical trials, which came up as an important caveat, an important endpoint at the recent IWG MDS meeting. And then finally, reimagination of hospice care, in which we include things like per, um, transfusion support for people, um, might also improve utilization of these, of these structures. So the IPSSM also told us which patients and which mutational events are likely to improve, to, to correlate with res good response to hypomethylating and allogeneic transplant approaches. So these are forest plots, and the genes are listed um, along the left side of each graph. And what you can appreciate is specific mutational events are associated with good response to HMA and transplant, including the gene DEX41 and other genes in the list here, and that specifically mutations in the multi-hit TP53 state associated with poor response to both HMA therapeutics, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and lenalidomide. So what about DDX41? Um, for a long time, we used to say that developing MDS was bad luck. Well, it turns out that that's not entirely true. Germline DDX41 mutations turn out to be not that uncommon in MDS, and I think, as alluded to by the previous speaker, I think we're going to learn more and more about this. It turns out that DDX41 mutations occurred in about 3% of this 3,000 patient cohort. These mutations are strongly associated with risk for AML transformation, but also associated with favorable overall survival. And interestingly, in this cohort, a majority of these mutations were, germ were likely germline events. The second hit is most often a second mutation in the DDX41 gene. Um, these patients present at an age equivalent to that for the general population of patients with MDS, and they generally respond well to hypomethylene agents and transplant. So these data recapitulate work that was previously published by Dr. Furstein and colleagues last year at the, at the ASH meeting in which they looked at serial patients referred for allogeneic transplant, and they demonstrated the strong recognition of DDX41 mutations within this cohort of patients at the older end of age. So finally, what else does IPSSM teach us? Well, we're now reassured that secondary MDS outcome, oh no, what happened? My slides are, are messed up. I had pop-ups here. <laughs> anyway, in secondary MDS, outcomes depend on molecular profile. So you'll have to believe me that this, these slides had a pop-up that showed uh, the, the survival curve for patients. Um, overall, secondary MDS patients generally do poorly, do more poorly than primary MDS. But if you look at patients within the context of risk attributed by the IPSSM, in fact, lower-risk patients with secondary MDS survive about the same as lower-risk patients without secondary MDS if you account for molecular profile, and higher-risk patients do the same. Uh, within this cohort, hemoglobin, bone marrow blast percentage, and platelets remained prognostic, but not absolute neutrophil counts. And finally, SF3B1 mutations are favorable, 
Uh, but commutational events actually leaven this favorable outcome. So in people with deletion 5Q syndrome, the co-expression of an SF3 one mutation actually makes patients do less well. And commutational events in things like NRAS, BCORL1, BCOR, RUNX1, STAG2, SRSF2 are also associated with less favorable outcome. Oh, there we go. So there was my, there was my pop-up. Um, so finally, uh, what defines the TP53 multi-hit state in patients with MDS? Please select your answer. Everybody did very well. So I'm very happy to take questions, and I'm sorry about those technical difficulties. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>